And I'll be talking about some of the changing paradigms for management, publication, and sharing, which ultimately is really leading to what I would refer to as open science. And in the next few minutes, I'll be covering several things. One, I'll start out with some brief definitions, talk about some of the benefits of data sharing, which will probably be intuitive to most all of you. Then I want to focus some examples on data sharing in ecology in the United States and provide a, a brief history in terms of what's happened there over the last few decades. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the challenges and solutions to open science and then conclude with some best practices uh, for promoting open science and then also what uh, we have in store for the future. So without further ado, uh, data sharing um, is pretty obvious in terms of what the definition is for that. This comes from Wikipedia, but I think we could all agree that this is a fair definition. It's just basically making data available for use by other investigators. Uh, so that's a simple definition. If we look at a more I think, comprehensive and useful definition today, uh, this one that's put forth by the Open Knowledge and the Open Definition Advisory Council in October of 2014, I think is uh, a really good starting point. And they define an open work that, a, that supports open science is following the three key principles. And the first one is there's an open license, such as a Creative Commons license that's associated with the data product. And this includes the freedom to use, build on, and modify, and share the data product. Uh, secondly, refers to accessibility. And this is the data product should be uh, ideally available uh, via download from the internet without any financial charge for that. And then lastly, and I think an important one in uh, for us to think about is the open format side of it. And this refers to the fact that data should, again, ideally be machine readable, available in bulk, and then provided in an open format, or at the very least can be processed with some kind of an open source software tool. And again, this promotes the open uh, science and open work type environment. So with respect to data sharing, I think Again, we're all probably familiar with a lot of the uh, benefits of data sharing. The most commonly cited one is that it's for the public good. So the data are valuable products of the scientific enterprise and they should be treated as such. Secondly is public trust. And we've seen a lot of examples in the literature the last few years that have focused on things like climate gate and other uh, real challenges to in, in the scientific environment about misuse or misinterpretation or uh, in some cases fraudulent data that have been uh, produced. So this uh, again creates a need for enhancing the public's trust in science. A third key component is uh, one of the benefits that we've seen documented in several publications including some by Heather Piavar are the increased credit that scientists get from sharing their data products. In this case if you make your data available as a product then it's more likely that your publication is also going to be cited more than those publications that don't include or make it available the data. And then lastly, there's one that's been appearing on the international radar screen uh, lately, which is association with human rights. And this is that you know sharing data or availability of scientific data is considered a human right by the UN and, and other international bodies. But from my perspective as uh, an environmental scientist, uh, background is that uh, by sharing data, we can more easily and readily tackle some of the grand environmental challenges that we face today. And that's exemplified by all of these different magazine covers from Time Magazine, The Economist, Science, Science and, and others, again, that focus on many of the, the challenges like climate change, uh, energy usage, and so on that we're faced with now and will be for the next uh, probably many decades. So if we step back and think through um, how data sharing has evolved in ecology, uh, I'm going to use the United States as an example here. Um, with one, I'm more familiar with it. And secondly, there have been some advances there that have been adopted internationally that uh, I'll touch upon briefly. First of all, if we go back to the uh, International Biological Program, this was like the first decade-long, large-scale international program focused on 
uh, ecosystem science. And this was done in a number of biomes around the world, uh, forested, grassland areas uh, internationally. You can see the example from the stamp on the lower right. Uh, the government of Canada uh, created a stamp recognizing the importance of the International Biological Program. And again, it's been in, it was implemented in many countries around the world at different pace, but all during that one uh, decade. Uh, Dave Coleman wrote a, a book on called Big Ecology that focuses on the International Biological Program and many of the subsequent programs that evolved from that. Uh, the thing about IBP that was interesting was it was really geared from the inception as being a program that would facilitate uh, modeling and synthesis of data across all of these different biomes internationally. And to have that as one of its goals, it was interesting that um, John Porter and Tom Callahan in a 1994 analysis uh, looked at that program and reported that data policies and protocols were never elaborated nor even agreed to in principle under the uh, IBP program. There were some major successes coming out of IBP, and that was largely due to uh, a number of smaller working groups or synthesis efforts that uh, individuals contributed their data, but it was done in more of an ad hoc type fashion. And I think arguably, uh, most of the data that were collected under the IBP program are no longer readily accessible for uh, use by scientists. So that was a first sort of uh, stepping stone into uh, this whole concept of open science and how do we uh, support that, that type of an effort. And it was not necessarily a big success. If we step fast forward a couple of decades in the U.S. from uh, the mid 60s and 70s up to the 80s, then we had the inception of the long-term ecological research program in the United States. This started in 1980 with, uh, I think, six initial sites that were funded. There are now roughly two dozen uh, sites in the uh, long-term ecological research program in the U.S. The um, first decade, there were no real uh, specific guidelines with respect to how data were managed within and across sites. Uh, and that created some real challenges that were rec recognized by both the National Science Foundation that funded the program, as well as many of the researchers that were involved in the uh, projects themselves. So this led to, in 1990, uh, LTR guidelines for site, site data management policies. And this came out, in, again, in 1990. The challenge with it was, was it laid down some guidelines, but every site was sort of given lots and lots of leeway in terms of how they implemented those uh, recommendations. So there was, uh, again, a bit of a lack of consistency with respect to how data were managed and shared across the network. Um, by 2005, this was recognized as being a challenge, and all of the uh, site principal investigators got together and came up with a, a much stronger policy that required that uh, data uh, standards, data uh, requirements be standardized across the entire network. And that was approved by the LTR coordinating committee in 2005. And then under the caption, the, the figure caption there, you can see that since then, uh, we now have about 20,000 data packages that are readily available, freely downloadable uh, through the LTR data web portal that have, have been created by the uh, LTR program. So that has been a huge success and it's led to lots and lots of synthesis efforts subsequently. There have been some external factors as well that have influenced uh, data sharing and data management policies in the U.S. Uh, the first one steps back to uh, the National Science Foundation, which in 2001 released its policies uh, for data sharing, and they, they had the expectation that investigators would share data and other uh, results of the scientific process uh, within a reasonable time and at incremental cost. Uh, under the Bush administration in 2007, we had the America Competes Act, which uh, required procedures be put in place to facilitate data exchange across all the different federal agencies in the U.S. And that was recently strengthened this year, in fact, uh, about a month ago, with the uh, NSF Public Access Plan, which uh, describes the implementation schedule for 
sharing both publications and data in public repositories. And these are all expected to go into full effect in implementation uh, by 2016-2017. Uh, in addition, uh, under the Obama administration in the U.S., we've had the last few years a big focus on what's called the Open Government Initiative. And this also was recently updated uh, just a week ago with uh, some of the formal guidelines there that uh, require uh, different levels of access and openness to uh, both data and publications. There are two major studies that have looked at data sharing across uh, the scientific community. This is one from Wiley Publishers that uh, was just released uh, fairly recently. And then about four years ago, we had another study that was completed by one of my colleagues in the Data One project, uh, Carol Tenniper and several of her colleagues. And that one focused on the environmental sciences community in particular. And I'm going to share uh, some results from both of those studies. So first of all, with respect to the Wiley study, uh, I think one of the really interesting results there was if we look internationally at data sharing, uh, we passed sort of the tipping point where most scientists now agree with the uh, statement that they are quite happy and interested in sharing their data. Uh, Ten years ago, this would not have been the case. And I think we, uh, five years from now, we'll probably see even a much higher percentage uh, that agree with that sentiment. There are, of course, some differences across countries uh, and some differences across disciplines as well. Some of the reasons that um, researchers are hesitant to share their data are highlighted on the uh, right side of the chart here. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in this slide here and uh, group some of those challenges together and recognize that there are really four major uh, impediments to data sharing. One is researchers want to make sure that they receive proper credit and attribution for creating the data products that they do. Uh, secondly, uh, and I think a challenge that is by and large still with us is the fact that many of the tools that investigators have access to for managing uh, data, such as metadata management tools, uh, have not uh, been particularly user friendly or necessarily readily available. And I will highlight one uh, particular exception to that uh, later in my talk. Education has been another key area where uh, I think most researchers would argue that they need better education about several things. One is best practices uh, for managing data. Secondly, uh, and I think this is universal, probably all of us uh, on this webinar uh, would agree that uh, it's very difficult to fully understand legislative uh, responsibilities uh, and other issues associated with intellectual property rights, confidentiality, and ethical aspects. The legal jargon can be quite convoluted and, in fact, uh, there are real challenges when we cross international boundaries. What may be legal or appropriate in one country may not necessarily be legal and appropriate in an adjacent country. Uh, so we definitely need much better education with respect to that. The third sub-example here under education is perception. And clearly in the past, a lot of scientists have felt like, well, if I share my data, I'm going to likely be scooped. Uh, be misinterpreted. Some of them misuse my data. One that really got me was about 10 or 15% of the Wiley respondents said that they felt that their data were not relevant. And uh, I think if I were in particular seeking additional research funds from a sponsor, I would probably not admit that my data are irrelevant. But anyway, I think uh, education has gone a long way to help flip the tipping point uh, about the perceptions for data sharing. Lastly, incentives and disincentives and encourage data sharing. That's uh, Clearly recognition that for things like the tenure promotion process and so on, we need to make sure that those incentives are in fact there uh, to support researchers for sharing their data. I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, figures here just to emphasize some of my prior comments uh, and amplify those to a bit. So if we look at the upper left uh, panel in the quad chart here, uh, we, we see something that refers to the long tail of orphan data. And one of my colleagues, uh, Brian Heidorn uh, proposed this several years ago, and I think it, it really makes sense in that most investigators, when they really try and deposit their data or manage their data, they recognize that there are some 
big, uh, well-known repositories out there. Probably some of the more commonly known ones are uh, GenBank and Protein Data Bank for uh, sequence data and protein structure data in particular. Uh, and communities have rallied around those, and now it's uh, status quo to deposit your data in those particular repositories. Many researchers, uh, though, have not had access to similar type repositories, although that is changing. And those that have not have, in many cases, archived or attempted to preserve their data on their own laptops or desktop machines or possibly in a university or some other location. Uh, in many cases, uh, those sources are not secure for the long term, and we end up with data being orphaned and ultimately being lost over time. And this is also amplified by the uh, uh, figure in the upper right, which is a figure from a paper by uh, Tim Vines, uh, again, one of my colleagues, and uh, published this in 2013. And it's a really great uh, story about how data undergo entropy over time, how they're lost over time. He and his colleagues uh, surveyed a large number of data public or publishers of journal articles to determine whether or not the data were still available. And they found that over time, in a fairly rapidly drop off, uh, the data were lost, again, over a 20 year period, uh, a large percentage of the data were, were totally unavailable after a 20 year time frame. And there is a, a fairly steep uh, gradient in terms of uh, the loss of information over time. I think another point that really amplifies the need for education is illustrated in the lower right uh, bar graph, which is from a, a colleague of mine, Carol Tenniper. It was published in PLOS One uh, about four years ago. And she uh, was able to document the fact that most researchers did not use a metadata standard for creating their metadata. The second highest response rate was uh, that researchers said that they used a metadata standard that they created in their own laboratory, uh, which arguably is not necessarily a community-wide standard. And then only a, a much smaller fraction used uh, some of the main community-wide standards like International Standards Organization 19115 for geospatial data, uh, EML, as ecological metadata language, and, and several others there. And then lastly, the, uh, the picture of the uh, smokestacks in uh, London in the industrial period highlights the fact that most scientists, if they are interested in discovering data, really have very little idea about where to go. Uh, there are many, many repositories out there. A lot of them are small, as indicated by the little tiny smokestacks there. A few of them are quite large, like uh, maybe the GenBank smokestack and a couple of others. But it really is difficult to find data that have been archived or preserved in many of these smaller repositories. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the solutions to these challenges. And first of all, I'll highlight the fact that with respect to credit and attribution, uh, many scientific journals, uh, especially the big name ones like PLOS, Nature, Science, uh, Ecological Monographs, and others, uh, now require authors to share their data uh, that are that underlie uh, articles in those specific journals. And also importantly, there are quite a number of new journals that are emerging that are called data journals. And some examples there include the Geoscience Data Journal, GigaScience for extraordinarily large data sets, uh, Nature Publishing Group's scientific data, and then one that I've been involved with for the last decade thereabouts is the Ecological Archives for publishing ecology data papers. In addition to data journals, there are some uh, important data repository solutions out there. Uh, one of which many of you have probably heard of is uh, the Dryad Digital Repository. Uh, this is geared towards publishing data that underlie scientific publications. There roughly 75 or so major journals now that uh, are members of the uh, Dryad uh, Consortium, plus there are roughly another 100 journals, I think, that have had their data uh, published in Dryad by the authors. This provides a mechanism for, again, uh, linking, providing access to the data for the long term and then linking that to the publication. And I'm going to show you how that works uh, in the next couple slides. So in Dryad, an author, when they're uh, 
submitting a manuscript to a journal, they are requested by that journal to also submit the data to Dryad. And then Dryad makes a password available to the reviewers of the manuscript so that reviewers can look not only at the manuscript to see whether or not you know, the findings are uh, well described, but also they can look at the underlying data as well via Dryad. If the paper is in fact accepted for publication, then the uh, data are made available uh, at the same time. And importantly, there's a recommended citation for both the data uh, and the uh, paper as well. So what that looks like is this. If you, uh, in the upper left square uh, gray box, you can see there's a, a journal paper that's in systematic biology, and the data uh, and metadata files are in a package that is below that, which you can easily access. And then importantly, Dryad, the repository, links back to the journals as well, so that uh, if someone looks at the data, they can also go back and read the journal article and see where the data came from and get more information that way. And importantly, Dryad provides, that, again, that recommendation for citation for both the uh, paper and the, uh, the Dryad uh, data package so that uh, authors are essentially getting credit for both the uh, papers that are produced as well as the underlying data products. And this is what it looks like in the literature. Uh, so here's a paper by uh, Joseph Mascaro and colleagues, and they're citing a data product in the Dryad Digital Repository by Zan et al. It's accessible through that digital object identifier and the uh, Dryad citation. So in the next little bit, I'm gonna cover some of the tools that I think are, are instrumental in helping promote open science uh, more broadly. And I'm going to hover, cover a few elements of the data lifecycle that's illustrated here, going from data uh, management planning through collection, assurance, preservation, analysis, and so on. So with respect to planning, uh, there's one tool in particular that's proven extremely valuable in both the uh, U.S. and the United Kingdom, uh, and that is the DMP tool. In the U.K., it's a web-accessible version. In the U.S., it's a downloadable uh, package that you Access. And this is what it looks like here uh, at the uh, front end uh, web page uh, for the DMP tool. And what it does is I've signed in uh, as myself through the University of New Mexico here. You don't need to belong to any particular university in order to do this. It's uh, easily downloadable. And what this does is it steps you through the process of creating a data management plan that's now required in the U.S. and U.K. and uh, by uh, many uh, funding agencies, including private foundations such as the Wellcome Trust and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and others. In this case, I showed the National Science Foundation's requirements for the Biological Sciences Directorate. And you can see in the lower right, there's an open blank space where uh, an individual would create their response to a set of questions about uh, data collection formats and standards. And the University of New Mexico, above that, provides some guidance with respect to the answer that is provided uh, for this particular template. So uh, the DMP tool steps you through all of the uh, basic requirements for a good data management plan that would satisfy uh, a large number of different funding agencies. Then this can be published, uh, and you can, in fact, share this data management plan with your colleagues and others as well. So some other tools that are uh, very important, uh, Morpho for supporting uh, metadata creation and management. Uh, this is a package that can be downloaded and is used by anyone. It's great for, in particular, dealing with ecological, environmental, many other types of observational data. What it looks like is this. This is just one example of the resource screen, uh, and you can type in the name of the, the submitter for this, the creator of the data set. Uh, other information, such as an abstract, keywords using uh, thesaurus, such as maybe the NASA's Global Change Master Directory, uh, the temporal coverage for the data set, spatial coverage, and so on. And then you can upload the data file as well. In addition, uh, Morpho provides access to a number of other screens where you can go into much more uh, detail about the uh, data that is provided and uh, is part of the metadata and it can be updated, easily updated and revised over time. So it's, it's a very useful package in that respect. 
Under the uh, preservation umbrella, uh, I wanted to highlight a couple of things, or one in particular here to start off with, the uh, re3data.org. Again, many uh, researchers are not sure what public repositories exist worldwide. This is a great resource for that. It's a constantly growing. This is uh, uh, a couple weeks old or maybe a month or so old uh, in terms of when I uploaded this slide. At that time, there were about a thousand reviewed repositories. I'm sure it's much higher now. Uh, but you can do a quick search here for uh, under maybe a variety of keywords you might enter, and it'll point out those repositories that meet those uh, particular needs. And you can, or you could just browse through the uh, entire catalog if you so desire. But this is a great way to discover what data repositories exist uh, for different scientific domains and fields. Uh, with respect to discovery, uh, this is where I want to point out a couple of things. There are you know, clearly a number of approaches one can follow in discovering data using things like Google or Bing or other search engines, but quite often they don't lead to the types of data that you're looking for. Uh, so I want to introduce Data One. This is a, a project that I'm associated with in the U.S. It's an international uh, program to um, federate across data repositories. And we have three components to the Data One infrastructure. Uh, one is what we call coordinating nodes. And these provide a lot of the, the broad uh, services for replication, other network-wide services, the indexing and search tools are available through uh, the coordinating nodes and essentially metadata from all the associated data repositories that are part of the federation are searched as part of uh, data one services the what we call member nodes uh, are all of those different data repositories worldwide now that and we have a, a couple from australia that will soon be uh, made available through uh, data one infrastructure as well uh, including the uh, uh, ICOS web portal. And these are, again, all the different repositories worldwide that have actually host host the data, but they have shared their metadata with the uh, Data One uh, catalog and indexing service. There's a third component, what we refer to as investigator toolkit. And these are a variety of different tools where we, in most cases, provided a direct linkage uh, to the Data uh, One data resources. So a tool like One R connects data one with the uh, R uh, statistical analysis program, allowing researchers to easily access uh, data one data, you know, data that are held in any of the data one affiliated repositories, uh, do their analyses and possibly generate some new data that then might be uploaded to, again, one of the affiliated repositories. So this is what the website looks like. Uh, feel free to check it out, it's data1.org. Uh, basically, you might uh, click the search button at the very top, and then that would lead to uh, a more advanced uh, tool search here. Which, so in this case, I've just typed in the word tree. Uh, I could have specified a, a narrow range of dates or specific countries or typed in a bounding box, typed a, a state within the U.S., for example, and it would have narrowed down the search uh, based on those particular criteria. So looking at this broad response, and I got back this next screen, which um, listed a number of data sets at the very bottom, Condit et al. on growth and mortality of tropical tree species in India, and lots of others. Uh, and I could, using the faceted search tool above, uh, do some additional constraining on the uh, responses by focusing on data from a particular repository or by a particular author or even add in some additional keywords. So it's a very effective way to identify and get access to scientific data. And in this case, uh, we're looking at the metadata for the content at all paper I mentioned previously on tropical tree species in India. And if we read through the uh, if we scroll down and looked at the entire metadata record here, we may actually decide we want to download the data, and we can do so by clicking the download button, and we'll download both the data and the metadata that are associated with the data files. So this is what it looks like. These are the various data files and metadata records associated with uh, that particular uh, uh, data set. And again, we can download the entire package and have uh, ready access to that on our own uh, laptop.
laptop or desktop machine. So with respect to Data One, we're now uh, have about 30 large uh, national, international repositories that are part of this. And we're now hitting roughly uh, half a million uh, data products that are associated with the uh, Data One repository. Another area that is really helping uh, facilitate open science is in the area of analysis and visualization. And I wanted to provide a couple of examples here. Uh, there are a number of tools like Kepler, uh, Taverna, and VizTrails uh, that uh, make it possible to create workflows or scientific workflows that string together a lots of complex analyses that we can then share that workflow with others. People can possibly uh, repeat the same set of analyses we've done or modify those workflows, change them to meet their particular needs, and then possibly upload the workflows again to uh, another uh, uh, site where they can be downloaded and reused. So this is uh, one of the workflows I just wanted to mentioned in case you're interested in some advanced visualization tools. Uh, this one is called VizTrails. It's an open uh, package that you can easily download and use it to create some quite sophisticated uh, visualizations as depicted on the right side of the panel here. Uh, and in addition, VizTrails does uh, some really nice uh, add-on services. It collects provenance uh, data for how the data products are in this case, the graphics were generated. So it's easy to look back and see the sources of the data that went into that and, and so on. And then there's a nice tool that's been created through uh, Carol Goebel and David DeRoar in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is called My Experiment, and it's a great way to upload your workflows from a whole variety of packages, uh, including Taverna, Kepler, uh, VizTrails, and others. And in this case, we see a paper or a workflow that was created by Paul Fisher. There's an abstract about the uh, workflow, what it does. There are ratings by the uh, community that have uh, rated 4.6 out of 5. And you can see how many times the, uh, that workflow has been viewed. And then it's also been downloaded 1,600 times. Um, and you can, if you here, you can uh, click, the, click the green arrow on the right side and actually download that workflow, uh, attempt to repeat, you know, rerun the same workflow, or again, modify it and upload it back to uh, my experiment for others to use. Training has been uh, really key as we've been, again, moving into this open science framework. Uh, we've done a lot of training through Data One, and there are lots of other groups that have been involved in supporting training as well. One of the things we've done in Data One is also make, in addition to hands-on training, which we do at various uh, professional society meetings in the U.S. and elsewhere, but we also have uh, created what we call a best practices database. So you can either click on one of the uh, elements of the data lifecycle that shows up in orange at the bottom of the screen. So if you were interested in you know, what are some QA, QC mechanisms? You could click on Assure, and it will bring up some best practices with respect to that. Uh, there's also a, a, you can search entering in your own keywords for various best practices. And then importantly, in the center there, there's a, a thing called the Best Practices Primer, which we created this in response to the community who requested that there be a, a more or less a data management uh, a very simple data management guide that could be easily read and digested and they could immediately start you know, managing their data better. So we've created this uh, primer on data management. It was nine pages long, very short. Uh, you can download this, share it, provide it to your uh, students in your classrooms and so on. And it goes through all of the best practices with respect to um, the data lifecycle. There are pointers, links in the document to additional tutorials and other information about uh, managing data that you can uh, access as well. So I want to conclude with a couple of things. First, there are just some basic rules for or basic best practices for data sharing and contributing to open science. Uh, the first one is to, I think it's very important to create a data management plan. And if uh, you have access to a tool that allows you to publish that data management plan, do so. This really helps formulate a good solid practices for managing the data before a project gets underway. 
And what you're doing is basically stating how you're going to manage data during the project and then after the project is completed. Uh, secondly is to um, use some of the tools like Morpho to document your data to the maximum extent possible. Uh, and this means creating the additional descriptions about the data so that someone that's not familiar with the data can understand, interpret it, use the data uh, correctly. So this requires, again, lots of details about the methods that were employed, uh, where the data are located, the formats, uh, lots of other information. And Morpho is a great tool for helping you step through uh, those requirements for developing a good, solid uh, description of your data. And then lastly is to preserve the data in a, ideally a community repository. And then if you follow all those steps, then you've created a data product that uh, should be ready and sufficient for data sharing, discovery, and reuse by others. The uh, third recommendation is to publish your data, metadata, in either a data journal or something like uh, Dryad, which is an open digital repository so that you and others can easily go back to the data that are associated with publications uh, and then possibly reuse and continue to build science uh, based on that earlier data set. Uh, fourth, in addition to data, it's quite important that uh, you and others uh, be able to understand the methods that went into creating that data set and uh, possibly analyzing and interpreting it. So this is uh, where the aegis of the fourth recommendation here, which is to publish your analytical workflows and software. Workflows can easily be published in uh, my experiment. And then many uh, scientists now use uh, additional uh, repositories like GitHub uh, to archive their uh, software code for the long term and, and share that with the community as well. And then lastly, uh, I would argue it's important to uh, publish results in open journals. Uh, well, lots of them out there now, PLOS One, Ecosphere, that provide uh, free access to the um, uh, publications that uh, the scientists, that scientists create. So where are we heading in the future? I want to highlight just a couple uh, future directions in the open science movement. Uh, the first one, and I think this really encapsulates a lot of information here, so I'll step through it uh, from the top down. At the very top, we see a generation of ideas. That's sort of the first step in the scientific process. And a lot of scientists nowadays are getting ideas from places like uh, science blogs, Twitter feeds, and others. And then on the right side, it shows, you know, once as you're generating ideas and want to share those, you can, in fact, do so via something like an open laboratory notebook, of which there are many on the market, many uh, free and open source solutions as well. And uh, you might, in fact, do this as you're developing a research uh, project, uh, create an open lab notebook and share that information with the folks that are working in your laboratory or close collaborators or others. Uh, the second step, planning research and writing proposals. Again, you can get lots of great ideas from literature that you might discover through Mendeley or ResearchGate, other locations, and then if you're developing your proposal, you may in fact do that through uh, something you can open up to your colleagues like Google Docs, which uh, is how I've written, I think, the last five or six proposals that I've written. In terms of undertaking research and then going through that whole data life cycle, there are a lot of tools that you can take advantage of. And then lots of places where you can uh, deposit the products as well and share those. So on the right side, uh, for example, we see the DMP tool, GitHub for depositing uh, code associated with uh, maybe organizing and managing data, quality assuring the data. KNB is a repository for archiving the uh, metadata and the uh, data products. And then workflows, again, can be archived in my experiments, which were derived from, let's say, R, Kepler, BizTrails, or other workflows on the left side. And then when we go to disseminate results, there are lots and lots of places we can do that nowadays. Uh, we can uh, share our posters via things like Figshare, PowerPoint presentations via SlideShare, Code versus GitHub, uh, preprints via PeerJ, for example, as um, among others. And then publications via open source mechanisms like PLOS and then data metadata through uh, a variety of different uh, public repositories. Now, in data one, uh, 
we're doing a couple things to help promote open science uh, in the future. One is working on a provenance tracking system now. And the way this works is we're looking at historical CTD data from a, an oceanographic cruise. These were data that were collected in 2014. We can actually look at and download the data via data one. And on the left side, it shows the sources that uh, might have gone into creating that particular data set. This is a, a product that we'll be releasing in another year or so. So it's uh, not finalized yet. And this is part of the usability testing we're doing. But this is more or less what it may look like. Uh, so we see the sources for that particular data set on the left side. And then that data set, uh, historical CTD data from the Gulf of Alaska, may be used by two publications uh, subsequently, and those will be highlighted and clickable on the right side. So this is, again, one example of uh, being able to promote that reproducibility of science and being able to document where uh, data sets were derived from and how they were subsequently used. And then uh, lastly, I think another key activity that we're involved in is creating a semantic annotation tool. And this is for uh, data originators as well as others that may have used a particular data set uh, and want to come back and add in some, uh, some notes to that. So in this case, we see an example where several people are adding in different comments about the data set. And this may help amplify some of the methods that were used uh, by the, the data creator or there may be a couple of red flags that were identified or questions that were identified by users that could then be responded to uh, by one of the data originators, for example. So this is the equivalent of adding post-it notes to uh, data products so they can continue to be used and, and gain value over time. The last slide I had here was on the um, this whole topic of alt metrics. Again, I think this is really helping lead that trend towards open science and that there are mechanisms now like impact story, and this is a, a creation of Heather Piovar and some of her colleagues. So it's a, a, an enterprise where it tracks uh, the contributions of researchers in a whole variety of different areas. It will uh, highlight, for example, the number of papers you've had, the number of downloads of those papers, the number, or the number of citations of those papers. Uh, the number of tweets that you've had on your Twitter account and so on, and then lots of other uh, ways of documenting uh, scientific productivity uh, via this all metric approach. So, again, this is something that I think we'll see more and more of a focus on alt metrics over the future. And I'll conclude with just this. Again, this is our uh, website, data1.org. Uh, these represent a lot of the communities that we've tried to work with over the last several years. Of Creating Data One. Uh, the top left there is a senior scientist associated with the Global Change Research Program. The bottom left is a librarian associated with the University of California that uh, is interested in providing education resources for faculty members associated with the library. And then on the right side is a young investigator associated with the uh, Lake Baikal Research Program who's interested in data reproducibility as well as uh, providing tools to her colleagues project and your attention. Thank you.